in this episode, simply by commenting either here on beastofwar.com, here on YouTube, or on the little special thread we have on Facebook, you could win either da -da -da -da! Take away, either the Privateer Press tournament bag from Battle Foam or da -da -da -da! my personal favorite. This is the Pack 432 with the Mole system. We're going to be talking a bit about these in the show. Yep. Other than that, we've got a massive giveaway for backstagers. If you head on over to beastofwar.com and you're a backstager, we're giving away free digital copies of the Dust Tactics and Dust Battlefield version two rule books. Also, if you're a backstager and you are a pledger on the Dust Kickstarter, you have a chance of winning your entire pledge for free. Whoa, wait, what? For free? Yes, for free. Learn more about it in the show. Good morning and welcome to the weekender. It's Saturday morning. That can mean only one thing. It's time for looking at this running order, at least an hour of gaming goodness. I'm yep. Warren and I'm joined by Mr. Armour himself. If he crawled out of the African plains, he would be an armadillo. Warren! Ah, what? I see, see what you what did there. What are those critters with the armoured shell? I see what you did there. There's an extra syllable in there. That you and of course, as always, I'm joined by Justin. Hi guys. Justin the Incredible. Justin. <laughs> the Incredible? Yeah, Justin the Incredible. Have you been getting hit mail again? Justin is gearing up. Uh, next week there isn't going to be a weekender because yep. Justin's going on holidays, as yes. is Lloyd. Yes. And then hopefully this year I might actually get some time away as well. But you're going to QCon. Yes, and I can't wait because the guys from Protoss are going to be there, hopefully with AVP. So I'm hoping to get a couple of demo games in and learn how to play. They'll also have Warzone Resurrection there. Playing that as well. Also, the man himself, Sam, is going to be there too. Is Sam going as well? He's going as well. So. Well, if you're if you're interested in finding out what happens on the day, both guys will be there and we'll be reporting on Facebook, uh, which is kind of where for these kinds of events we have pictures and things like that going mm. up throughout the day. Uh, that Warzone Resurrection stuff is it's looking, looking really good. hot. Uh, ben has been playing it recently. He got a, a demo of it in AVP down in his Sturbridge store. I think that's pronounced correctly. It's a great store down near where Ben lives in the Birmingham area. Mm -hmm. And he posted up some pictures of it and I thought it looks great. Now he actually went away with some of the some of the soldiers from it, okay? Yeah. I'm still getting up to speed with this whole war zone thing. Um, but I think are they called the Iron Guard? I'm not sure. They're they're a very kind of um, Third Reichy looking army anyway, and he's been painting these guys up. We'll get some pictures up because they're on the Facebook page, Ben's Facebook page. And I'm thinking, you know, they're great. However, we have to have a word with Ben and get him over here and get him sat down with John or Rama mm -hmm. to learn how to base his miniatures. <laughs> uh, people have been watching miniatures ER this week. You only think I'm bad. Oh, no, 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 it, no, it, it, no, you are bad, no, okay? Uh, I haven't even got to miniature ZR yet, so, uh, 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 but he, I, what he, I, I seen yes, Ben's sir. painting, I thought, that's reasonable, ben compared to yours. Feet. Ben's painting was great. Mm -hmm. I, I, I loved what he did to the soldier, I thought the soldier was great. However, it's standing <laughs> on a base, it's and a you know the, the slaughter base, yeah. he didn't even fill in the slaughter. And he's... <laughs> so the, He's quoted to have said, someone commented on that picture yeah. and said, why didn't you fill in the slot? And he went, ah, I was lazy. I was lazy. <laughs> ben, no, 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 Ben. Just a little bit of green stuff. Hell, if you'd even chewed some Wrigley's and spat it on, it would have been better than that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to have the Ben basing challenge uh, to get him up to speed yeah. on that because mm -hmm. that, that is unforgivable. Speaking of unforgivable, uh, this week for the backstagers we had a real treat. So the, the the 12 essential techniques for the technique toolbox has come to an end of that first season. Mm -hmm. And we followed up with something 
absolutely mighty and that was miniatures er so if yeah. you're a backstager come over and watch this because it is hilarious and also if you're thinking about trying the seven day free trial this might be the one to jump in and have a look at because it is brilliant yeah give it a go there'll be a link here just on the screen just click it it's harmless it'll take you there make sure you're logged in to bc4 so create a free account first okay mm -hmm. and that gives you access to all the forums and everything once you've got that free account you can then sign up for the seven day free trial and hell if you don't like it well, you can always just quit before the seven days. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you that if you quit before the seven days, I will refund you the money that you didn't spend. There. 100%. Guaranteed. 100%. <laughs> but anyway, we had, we had Miniatures ER and it was hilarious. So Miniatures ER is a little show that we, we're going to be doing you know, maybe once or twice a year. Maybe a bit more often because it is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And what happened was uh, Justin submitted himself to this for the pilot. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I put my hand up and went, you know what? I know my paint is not great and I want to see if a man can save any of my hostages. Yes, and the hostages is the only way to describe it. Yeah. Yeah. So Roman went through Justin's collection. So he, he, he got <laughs> three out of it. Yeah, he found three out of the collection. And what he does is he... He talks about the three, he talks about what's wrong with them. And actually, as funny as the opening to the video is, it's well, informative. The, the quote of the year was, and I believe Justin base coated this with his feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw your first comment that was just like, oh God, I'm only five minutes in and I can't stop laughing. I was laughing so much. I yeah. couldn't believe it. It was hilarious. But as funny as it is, it was also fascinating because Roman's going in and talking about the the, yes. the issues with it. Here's what went wrong, and mm -hmm. here's why it went wrong. Why it went wrong. And I thought it was brilliant. And so even the first 10 minutes of that video, just mm -hmm. of going through the what went wrong, why it went wrong, mm -hmm. and then it's a, it's a, a three-parter, is it? I, I'm going to be doing it in three parts, I think. That's, mm -hmm. It's the way it seems to be edited down. What a lot of people so, don't realize with Three Colors Up is I'll get a massive raw file, and then... The points for Romance waiting for stuff to dry and stuff, I'll quietly remove in the background mm -hmm. so that it's not. So we think it's a three parter, but after that 10 minutes, he then gets into actually repairing the miniature mm -hmm. by just repairing it. Mm -hmm. This is not a repaint, so he's not just starting from scratch. No, I mean, he's there's going one or two points where he does scratch a little bit off if it's a little bit over cake, but other But than I that, think that's brilliant because yeah. I'd be terrified to do that. Mm -hmm to pick up a miniature and go at it with a blade. Mm -hmm. you know, and he's fixing things like, oh, and there's a mold line that Justin forgot. Yep. <laughs> and confidently just wicking it off because he knows that techniques that he's gonna use on top of the paint job mm -hmm. that you had already done, yep. he was going to, to take it to, you know, it's well above tabletop standard. Yeah, the, like, the, the finished one. It's, it's this one is, of the comments I put in was, I was amazed by how well it turned out at the end up. Unbelievable how well it turned out. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that's some of the bits and pieces that, that's going on in uh, Beasts of Warland. Yeah, so. right. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Are you going to follow through on your threat in that comment thread of saying that to hell with anybody else sending minis in, I think we're just going to do it with your collection, Justin. Uh, or are we going to let backstagers, frontstagers get in touch? With uh, look, if you, if you fancy subjecting your <laughs> miniature uh, to the miniature's ER, um, where you can pick out something that's fairly atrocious, okay, fairly atrocious, and you want to send it over, and then in the next episodes that we film, which will be in the next few weeks, mm. we'll sit them down in front of uh, Rama, and Rama can pick and chew them, uh, pick and choose from them. Now, at the very least, if he doesn't repaint, do a repaint job on it, he will do a critique on it of the issues and things like that mm -hmm. um, and how to avoid those, uh, those yeah. issues. At the very most, what he'll do is, um, is he'll then go through and repaint them. Mm -hmm. Now, typically, um, th these miniatures we wouldn't send back. So if it's, a very, if it's a very sentimental miniature or if it's something high value... Or a limited edition. Or a limited don't, edition. Yeah, don't no, do. don't, you don't want to be doing this. It's not that they go in the bin, but anything that's ever painted on Beasts of War, we, we pack it up safely and store it away because who knows? Yeah, we, someday, we have the Holocene. Someday we may be able to do, you know, Beastland. And in Beastland, you'll be able to come in and there will be a Hall of Fame with miniatures from all companies from all over the world. But in one corner of that will be all the miniatures that have mm -hmm. appeared in painting tutorials and things like that. Can I have so, my name on the bar? I'm, I'm very tempted to try and send him one of my tanks. Because I know he doesn't paint armor and he, he abhors armor. He's like, yeah. why would I want to paint all these large, flat, 
blank faces and it's like, but that's what I do. <laughs> you, you have actually chatted to Roman about your different painting styles and it is just kind of that moment of you're looking at each other across the room just going, I appreciate what you do. I appreciate what I you think do. that was, that actually happened at one point. Yeah, it, it's a bit more of, yes, mutual appreciation, but neither <laughs> understands the <Yes>. other. <laughs> Never the twain shall meet. He looks at me and goes, pigment powders? And I look at him and go, wet blending? <laughs> <laughs> So um, yes, uh, we will have to see. Look, if you if you fancy getting involved in it, it's open to you if you want. Mm -hmm. um, we'd love to to you know get a you know, selection of interest and stuff. However, I don't think we've got any shortage of it uh, of stuff that's badly in need of ER. Myself, I've got stuff yeah, in there and as well. Sam, so and I don't think Brad uh, has picked up brush in a couple of years. But if you if you fancy it, by all means, uh, we'd love to see some monstrosities. Yeah, and I would love to put some hilarious monstrosities under Roman's well, you see, nose if, to see if, how. If someone was mad fires. enough to send through a badly painted limited ed limited edition mini, I think Roman would just go ah, die. Yes, he probably would die on camera. Yeah. So, and we don't want that. <laughs> no, we don't want that. <laughs> okay, so, um, tons to get through. Right, what's happening in the world? First things first, dust. Mm -hmm. This is it now, guys. We're creeping in. We're in the last. We're in the last few days. This is the home stretch now. This is where, well, hopefully, some of the big unlocks happen because yeah. mm -hmm. there's talk that if it gets to the big unlocks around three seven five k or whatever. You, they're looking at potentially like free walkers and stuff like that. They're going yeah, into some ooh, of the pledge levels. Goodies. So it, it's it, there's some seriously good stuff going on there. However, one of the things that I was interested in was the you can whenever you buy dust, you get a box. And I wonder, do I have um, one on set? Yes, there. Let me see. Don't think we can really get at one, uh, can we? Do you want me to reach it? Here we go. Ah, hang on. We have there's one there. A bunker. So whenever you buy dust, there's yes. a bunker, okay? Yeah, um, I think that's empty, if I remember right. No, no. No, no, no. no. Well, hey, it, it is not. It is now. Everywhere. Um, <laughs> of course, I turned the whole thing upside down. So I drop miniatures. Anybody that knows me on Beast of War knows I drop miniatures. Yeah, well, we have enough there to show how they turn out to begin with. Well, yep. the stuff that you get comes pre-base coated. Mm. So. so let me throw this under the close cam to see. So yep. as part of the bunker, you get some awesome looking weaponry. Yeah. So, and that's what that looks like. And all of this stuff in dust, which I really like, is articulated and I think it just looks great. The bunkers are a cool, cool kit, mm -hmm. okay? However, that's not the only option. And one of the options that I have been absolutely fascinated by, I'll just move that all out of the way, nice and subtle. was that in Dust Studios, there is an option to buy your stuff direct from Dust Studios where they have a team of painters mm -hmm. that'll uh, actually do the stuff pre-painted for you, mm -hmm. okay? Now, they're pre-painted, this is the thing. The picture that you see on the box, that's maybe not such a good uh, I, I example of it. I bring up an image it. of a coolly painted yeah. one from the box. That's exactly what you get. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, I wanted to put this to the test, okay? Because I, I, I'd thought to myself, yeah, but the stuff on the box like looks really, mm -hmm. really good. And we have a new series that we're going to be kicking out into backstage called Dust to Dust, where Jono is going to take us through Step by step, how we go from this level, where it comes with its uh, base it's, coat. It's nice, it's easy to play with. Where you could stick it out, you take it out and play with it straight away. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we want to take that to uh, basically to the top level, where we show you all the techniques of weathering and things like that there, the steps that you can take that and turn that into something awesome. Something a little like this. Now, I will attest, this is exactly <clears throat> how it came to us, because it's just came out of the box and been put together. Yep. To put the Dust Studios to the test, we got a hold of one. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what one of the finished products comes out like from the studios uh, for two reasons. One, I wanted to show you guys what you get if you go down that route mm -hmm. of buying something from Dust Studios and come, have it come to you pre-painted. And let's be honest, there's plenty of us out there that just don't have the time, but maybe have the spare cash to say, you know what, I want to play with a beautiful army. Mm -hmm. I have some spare money set aside to do it. I don't have the time to do it myself, or maybe yeah. don't have the skills or you know the drive to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Wow, 
Yeah. yeah. You, know, you just buy it and it comes like that. Now it came in a few separate pieces. Um, um, you can either glue them or keep them. So things like the little hatches and stuff are I all like separate. The fact that the hatches are pre-pinned. Yes, there's a little yeah. pin and all on them there. So um, hopefully we can get some close up stuff of this. But mm -hmm. the, the paint effects on it is absolutely fabulous. The antennas are, are all on it really fine. Metal? Yep. It's like it's like it's, a fine plastic like, or metal antenna. It's a bit like fish fish wire, fish line. Yes, yeah, so it, it's it just is so so cool. To have the ability so cool. to order that up and just open your box from the post and go. Yeah, love it. Now the other reason I wanted to pick one up is I also wanted to, for myself and John to see where dust to dust could potentially go. Yeah. Mm. So we wanted to get one of these so that we could uh, basically have a look over, see all the techniques and things to get to this level. So dust to dust um, will take it to um, at least this level. So if you are someone that has the time and the inclination, uh, you might want to join that series and uh, follow along and you can uh, have your stuff looking um, uh, rather like this, but not to detract from that no. at all. No, because no. that is superb. It's it's unbelievable. I cannot. If only, if only all pre paints were as good as this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, we we would be in a very very different marketplace right now. Yeah. If the stuff that had come out of uh, the AT forty three from Rackham at the time had been like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe some of it, maybe some of it was, maybe they had the custom stuff. The thing is, is very, very manual, but this dust studio have this team just dedicated to this. And I couldn't believe that what you actually get from that service is box art. Yeah. Is box art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow. Absolutely Question crazy though, stuff. Do they have a system where uh, you can select what color scheme you want? That's a very good question. Because that would be cool. Instead that's of, a very good I question. I know that's brilliant. And that's the base color and mm -hmm. all the nice weathering and stuff on it. Mm -hmm. But what if there was an option to say, I want camouflage? I don't know. Is there? Well, we will have to. Oh, do you know or, what? That's a question worth asking them. So we'll get across it, and ask them on that one. Would it be a case of going, OK, we have the desert theater, the winter theater, forest theater. There's three different I, I suspect that what it is is you get you get it in, currently from what, what I've seen of the Kickstarter, OK? They've been uploading pictures of the stuff that's going through the ProPaint, mm -hmm. OK? And there are is tons of it. Like, I mean, tons and tons of this stuff. Um, and it's all, it's all the same theater. So I think what happens is when you buy the army, it comes like that. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would probably make a lot more sense, John. And it would make more sense from the point of view of how dust are able to do it yep. because mm -hmm. they're not a pro painting service. Exactly. What they're doing is they're provided pre-painted miniatures mm -hmm. to uh, a, a professional the level. Theater. So you, yeah. you probably just buy it, you just go in, you buy it, and you get it to do whatever theater it is that you've, you've bought it for. Mm -hmm. But I've got to say, I, I've, I'm well impressed. I'm so, so impressed by that. It's, it, it's such a great piece of work. So um, keep an eye on this one, because who knows? I, I think we might even give that away as a prize at some point. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, keep your eyes peeled for if that. I, if I don't make away with it first, um, but we will be we will be analysing it for for dust to dust. Mm -hmm. So, there are things that we have going on this weekend. Um, right now on beastofwar.com, if you're a backstager, okay, we're giving away free, complete digital versions of the new Dust rulebook, mm -hmm. okay? That includes tactics, and includes uh, Battlefield, it's all in there. So if you ever wanted to get to grips with this game, uh, I challenge you not to like it. You know, we have a, a demo video up at the moment yep. where Phil Yates, fantastic game designer, uh, one of the designers behind Flames of War, is taking you through the basics of how the game plays and how similar the, the core functions of mm -hmm. both games are. Well, I mean, you and Lloyd did the, the demo game of Dust Tactics. And that was version two of the rules, so. Yeah, you were helped for maybe, what, first two, three activations, and mm -hmm. then you were just playing on your own. Yes, it's, it's... so quick and easy to pick up. And it's it's one of those games that you, you get to grips with very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. But it's easy to play, but difficult to master. That's yeah. the point. 
Yeah, there's there's there there's no shortage of depth uh, depth to this. And when you go battlefield, okay, that opens up platoon rules and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's when it really starts to get even more interesting. So, mm -hmm. it's it's one game that you can play in a couple of flavors. If you want to play it as a board game, Tactics is there to do it. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you love your terrain and stuff, we love our terrain. Then battlefield mm -hmm. is, is the way to go. Um, so, I challenge you to have a look at that rule book, see what you think, and if it's something you like, why not head on over to the Kickstarter. And yes, if you're so inclined, you can take the seven day free trial, come across and grab that rule book. We would hope that you might spend a few days and have a look and see what uh, if you like the rest of the content and stuff, but if that was your only thing, yes, you could do it that way. You could uh, hop on over and get that and see what you think. The other thing then is, as I've said, we have a post up at the moment, okay, where uh, this is exclusively for backstagers. So you need to be a backstager to submit your entry mm -hmm. and you need to be a backstager at the time that your entry, uh, your entry is drawn and that'll be sometime after the Kickstarter ends. Mm -hmm. If you're on that Kickstarter and you're a backstager, you can submit your details to us. Mm -hmm. We'll then pass it on to Dust Studios, yep. okay? And they will select a, a, a winner at random yep. from that, and they will win. They'll have their entire pledge cost reduced to zero, mm -hmm. which I think is awesome. That is, awesome. You know, that is a cool, cool price. Thing. So uh, go and give it a go and uh, see what you think. I'm really excited about the Dust stuff because there's so much stuff getting unlocked. Yeah. And the value for money is getting better and better and better. And to finish it off before I move on to the next segment, there's an SSU tank to die for. Take a look at this. We're going for a break and then we'll be right back. And we're back. That was quick. Okay, I didn't even get a manage to get a drink. Okay, moving on. Um, storage. Before we get to storage, though, I read the comments. I read almost every comment that ever comes through. Not everyone there, so there's too many, but I do read them. And one particular commenter caught my attention. And he said, Dear Beast of War, For God's sake, will you fix that? at at in the back and make it stop looking like a chicken so while we're on let's get this thing <laughs> fixed before it annoys anybody else there we there we go i'm always scared to touch that in any form of rough fashion just in case something goes wrong is that better <laughs> uh, please you're, you're gonna have a comment below just going no yeah they don't walk like that or something so there you go fixed right one of the things that we have found since moving into the new studio is uh, it's, it's smaller than mm -hmm. what we've had before, um, better designed than anything we've had before, more comfortable than anything we've had before, but smaller mm -hmm. and storage is an issue. So um, I wanted to, to have a look at some bags recently. Mm -hmm. So I, I got in touch with Battlefoam because they had some new bags out that I wanted to, to have a look mm -hmm. at, okay? I'm gonna start with my favorite of them. Okay. okay, and that's the pack moly. Now, if you pass that up to me, right? I want to wax lyrical about this for a little while. Now, if everybody knows who Battlefoam is yep. by this stage, yep. okay, uh, we've we, we've covered Battlefoam stuff in the past. We've, you know, we've caused concussion on your head with Battlefoam. I yep. remember that someone took that into a GIF. Where is that GIF? I want to see that. Yeah. What? Yeah, <laughs> if you know where that GIF is, link it below. We've uh, we've been using Battlefoam. Um, for quite some time now, and the pack, uh, the pack um, system. system is by far my favorite product of what Battlefoam do, bar one other little one I'm going to show you at the end of this segment. But what I love about the pack system is the pack system is designed that the, the trays are all a standard size, yep. and you get different pack bags that some of them even zip together. Yeah, some of them bolt together. And there's pack a pack storage system with uh, storage uh, storage boxes, I suppose, yeah. that are made of the same stuff that you can zip together. I think pack 
is one of the most versatile and useful systems that we've ever had. So much so that we actually transport our studio equipment around yep. in pack. Yep. So whenever we're going on location, um, we actually use the, the big pack bag. Is it the 17 no, 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 or something? No, I think it's uh, 1080 or something. The big one. Yeah, we use the, the big, big one, one. With the wheels on the bottom. And then we have, uh, we have a slightly smaller one that we actually zip on top of, uh, on top of that. Mm -hmm. And it means that as we're going around, we can carry an immense amount of studio equipment. So we carry cameras in it, we carry lights in it, we mm -hmm. carry microphones in it, we carry a mixer. <laughs> Sometimes. The occasional. <laughs> um, so everything uh, is put in it. And we have never, ever had uh, breakage yep. or anything ever go wrong. Yeah. Now we've had issues with the bags themselves. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one that I'm going to show you is, is we have used them an awful, awful lot. And what we found was that they used to split a little bit yeah. here and here. Yeah, it was just the pressure point from holding it with, say, something reasonably weighty, say, mixer, cameras and stuff, you're lifting yeah. it, and that's putting quite a bit of stress on the corners. Mm -hmm. But what we've seen now in this, this is the newest iteration of the pack, and it's got the Mole system, which I want to talk about in a minute. But for me, one of the key things was right here at the top, you'll see these four rivets, okay? Now those rivets basically go all the way through mm -hmm. the plastic. So they actually go that side as well. So yep. that plastic interior, that rivet goes all the way through. And that should stop that problem that we had where things were, were splitting along the top. So it's kind of one of the things that I really like about the Battle Foam stuff. Yeah, they're not the only bag maker in town, but they constantly innovate. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always like, let's be honest, it's a bag. Mm -hmm. You know, how much innovation could you get in a bag? But I've got to say to the team over at Battlefoam, they do surprise me because mm -hmm. year on year, they find improvements mm -hmm. and no, nothing is perfect. You can't expect any product to be perfect, but they keep looking for improvements. Yep. And secondly, they do find innovations and things like that. And where they that keep coming up with new designs. Yeah, and they see them in, in other things that, the, for example, that the military's doing. They're very heavily yeah. um, kind Influence. of influenced yeah. by the military. So, and that brings me to this Moly system, which I think is fantastic. So here you have your Pack 432, Previously, it had none of this mole stuff for webbing on it. So basically, whenever you put your stuff into the bag, that was it. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was the end of your storage capacity. But now, with that mole system, you can apply all sorts of little added extras. This one here is called, this is called the phone accessory pack. Okay, so you can stick your phone in there. You can put oh. dice or whatever phone, in there. Dice, tapes. Yeah. Um, but again, it's, it's handy little extras that'll fit anywhere on the bag. So it would go, it can go there, or if you want, you could start to put it there, or on the back, you could start to lay out a whole bunch of different yeah, things, depending different on what you're carrying. What you're carrying. I think it from the, the pack system was always pretty flexible anyway, yep. but I think that has just taken it another step yeah. for me. The key, the key, and I think it's definitely something Romeo has been thinking a lot, the key is customization. Mm. Yes. Because not, yeah. you, you'll have your, like we find with the older bags, you're wandering around going, well, now the bag's full. Yes. And what if I want to carry some of my electrical equipment with it, like mm -hmm. the iPads or something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, they, they have one for the iPad as well. We don't have it here. Yeah, there's one, one for the iPad. There's this one here, um, <clears throat> no, which I was tr trying to show you the back, held on with four clips, mm -hmm. so it's nice and robust. It's really solid. It's so oh, robust, we can barely solid, take it off. Yeah. There's, there's a solidity to that. Let's try and get it out. So there we go. It's two. And just like there anything that's influenced by the military, it can be awkward to... Oh, well, it's yeah, rugged, to, to yeah. Organize. But it, yeah, it's rugged. <laughs> this one here, I, I'd written it down because I forgot. It's called the pocket pack. Mm -hmm. Now, that's for your wash gear. <laughs> <laughs> that's for your body deodorant, your aftershave, and in my case, the razors that I hate using. Um, Again, pointed out in the comments. What well, <laughs> is that for? Emergency can of energy drink. Oh, you could fit... You could fit two that. cans of Relentless in that. Exactly. Oh, so after the show, you're down, you're out. Mm. Ha ha! 
I've been off now relentless for a few right, for a few weeks. Shake. It's uh, it is catching up on me. But I, I did that. That was terrible. That's it. So energy drinks, yeah. yes. Yeah. To be fair, though, wash kit. Wash kit's more wash important. Wash kit. All right. Um, uh, somebody had commented on the site that you know I've been so anti-shaving these days. They think I'm showing my support to uh, the winning entry of the Eurovision Song Contest. I, I, I can say that's not the case. However, I think. I look rather fetching. <laughs> <laughs> so this one here has the standard loadout. It's a standard kind of 40K-esque loadout. So I'm just going to pull out the, the things. I think that this has got more solid as well. That is thicker than it was. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that I, is I, definitely. I did have a look at that earlier and wonder, is that top thicker? I yes, think it is. that is definitely thicker and heavier than, uh, than the previous one that we have been running around with. So. Yeah. Whichever of you guys uh, wins our competition in this one, um, so much as I really like the, the Privateer Press tournament bag, I think you'd be kind of nuts not to opt for that one, in Before my opinion. Before you put the Molly system down, there's one mm -hmm. thing you haven't mentioned, which What's Romeo that? mentioned when I was talking to Gianna at Gen Con. Right. That particular Molly system uh -huh. matches exactly with the military one. It doesn't, it does, does it? it? Yep. So, if you have any military pouches, or you have a surplus. So those long bag. ones that you get for carrying flashbangs and things like that. Well, yeah. again, it's it's that flashbangs at tournaments. So if <laughs> Battlefilm doesn't do your what you need types that you would want, you can have a look through military surplus stuff and it'll fit on there too. Now that's kind of smart, isn't it? It's that's kind of smart. Okay, show me the loadout. So right, we've got so a pretty standard 40k loadout that yeah. comes as standard. I think you, you can pick it up empty and you can pick it up with custom foam. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if you pick it up with that standard loadout, you're going to get tons and tons of troop trays, yep. your kind of more medium sized troops. Yep. And um, here, vehicles. Well, what have you got? You've got uh, Land Raider, two hmm. rhinos, Predator, two dreadnoughts, and something else. Bang. Dead easy. Yep. Dead easy. I'm actually always really surprised by how much you can, you can actually in. fit in yeah. to um, to three trays. Mm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, in terms of the foam, it's the foam that you've all come to expect. Yep. Um, I actually prefer this foam myself. I prefer it because of the hard base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was using another kind of foam recently uh, because we had packed some stuff into it during the studio move, mm -hmm. and I picked it up. And it's just folded. It, it spilled on me. Mm -hmm. from, so whereas this stuff has never, yeah, has never actually that spilled on me. Extra rigidity to it. From time to time, you can get a piece that might delaminate. Mm -hmm. But um, from what I can gather, any time we've had a piece that is delaminated, um, Battlefoam have been quick to to replace it straight away for us. So yeah. um, they they've always been very good from that perspective. Mm -hmm. All right, chucking that away, um, Justin, you have the tournament bag. Yes, this one I really really like. Because mm -hmm. this, all right, you've done the privateer press bag before. Yes. It's big, it's quite bulky. Well, it's not unlike the pack uh, uh, 432. It's, it's roughly the size of a 720. But it has its own custom size tray. So yes. if you're into your privateer press stuff, the pack stuff is all designed to go together. Mm -hmm. The privateer press stuff is designed to all go together. Yep. It doesn't mix and match so well. Yep. So it's. Um, but this is a brilliant one because it's a tall bag. For your colossals, your battle engines. Gantions, yeah. You know, this is perfect for it. I can mm. fit two colossals in there, easy. Yes. So and some, and you can put other bits and pieces in yeah, around yeah. it. So well, I mean, like, it, it, it's got standard loadout as well. So if you want to crack it open. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah. Let's do that. Is that padding I feel? Uh, on one side, because you've got an iPad pouch on that side, I believe. They've padded that. Yeah. Well, if you think you're walking about a convention. It's busy, people are bumping into you the whole time. That protects your iPad a little better, yeah. doesn't it? Just so this problem. side here, uh, you've got a pouch that's not padded, but this one here, it has actual padding in it, so that's for, that's for tablets and things yeah. like iPad, that. iPad, tablet, notebook, you're not going to fit a full laptop in it, but yeah. it's quite good. Um, another side. pouch at the front, Yep. anything in that? No, I always hook through these because you never know that maybe Romeo left some of his millions lying in one of these <laughs> or pick it out someday. No, you've got plenty of storage on the outside for your dice, your templates, your stat cards, whatever yeah. you need. Okay, so opening the bag then, right? So you've arrived at the tournament or yep. your game night, okay? Yep. And the bag goes, poop, again. Yep. There's weight to that again. They've got yep, them yep. four six. jobbies on it. Well, you've got oh, six, six on it. Oh, well, yeah, it's got a handle, handle well, yeah. yeah. 
Um, so they go all the way the through, and they have increased the weight mm. quite substantially of the tops of these yeah. things. On the back of that, you mm -hmm. got little oh, places to hold all your stack cards and stuff. Yeah. So would you split your stack cards up like that, Justin? Would you? Yes. As you a player. Why? why? That's the bottom layer. So that's my bottom layer of foam. Middle layer, middle layer of foam, top layer, top layer of foam. And then I know exactly where everything is. If you're oh, that words. well organized. Well, I generally try and do that with Anaheim and packing away. But okay. say I'm looking for my gun mages. Oh, they're in the middle. Done. Yes. So this is the bag for anybody that's <laughs> 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 it okay. was only a matter of time, Justin. <laughs> it was only a matter of time. Right. So talk me through what. Talk me through. Right. This is the standard loadout again, isn't it? The standard yeah. loadout for this particular bag. So right. So your top three trays uh -huh. are for your standard infantry. So okay. There they are. There. This is the half size of what you get in the battlefield bag. Yes. So if I put two of these together, and I already have a battlefield bag for. Privateer. So this is oh, right. This is compatible with all the rest of the Privateer Press stuff. Yes. So if you if you have Privateer Press stuff, yeah, you can have full trays, which is what two of these, or yep. you can get your half trays. Right. Yeah. Okay. So but whatever, whatever you have half today, tray wise, that. fit into that. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your next two are for your medium infantry. Yeah. So these are for those bigger base miniatures. Say you had uh, uh, what's their name? The Kador Boom ones. Hyler. I say the, the Man of War Shock Troopers, they'll fit yeah. into this nicely, or say you had uh, Gregor, Boomhyler and Co. Uh -huh. So they fit into that. The next one down, which you there have you there, go. is slots for six Warjacks, right? Yeah. So that's your big, heavy War Machines of Death. Mm -hmm. And the last one, which I really like the idea of... Pluck me! Yes. Fucking hell, it, it's, it's pluck foam! It's four inch pluck foam. Yeah. Because in each faction you have one Warcaster who is bigger than any Warjack. Mm -hmm. So for Kedor, it would be Karchev. For Signar, you've got uh, Darius. For well, Menoth, you've well, got the Well, Karchev's a Oh, I know, a but he's, he's just that bit bigger and spikier, so I would rather pluck this out and put him into it to keep him safer. I had a hobby moment. Yep. <coughs> Have you ever had hobby moments where there's been something that you've always really kind of hated, mm -hmm. and then you've had this an enlightening moment where suddenly you realize, actually, I really like it. I had that with pluck foam. Right. Um, I always hated pluck foam. Mm -hmm. I always found pluck foam to be a total pain in the buttocks mm -hmm. until we moved the studio from Essex. <laughs> and it was then that I realized just how good pluck foam is as a mm -hmm. product and how versatile it was. Because until that, I'd always thought of, oh, the custom foam, you know, it's all cut out, it all looks lovely yeah, and stuff yeah, like that. There. Stuff. But that versatility of the pluck foam, because mm. it was, whenever we started to try and pack away models that were not built to the manufacturer's yeah. way, mm -hmm. you know the way, like John, whenever we were doing the Ned Army, we turned the, the, the torsos of the Carnifexes upside down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as our Carnifexes weren't hunched over like old ladies, yeah, they were standing up. They were taller. reared up and and spiking and stuff like that. There, you can't pack them. <laughs> you can't pack them into into any kind of like normal kind of uh, foam. You need something that you can kind of either get something customized completely, mm -hmm. or that pluck foam stuff was yep. what saved us at the end of the day. We were able to work with the pluck foam and drop the Carnifexes in yep. and, and have them get right, it, home get through. Safe. Right, one final thing, because uh, I want to show you guys. Uh, I, I got this, and usual me, I didn't actually know what it was that I'd picked up. And it's called the D-Box, mm -hmm. okay, from uh, Battlefront. Now, what I wanted was, we work on projects, okay? And we, we, we always have probably a number of projects ongoing at any one time. Mm. We... Um, we're working on um, 40K stuff at the moment, mm -hmm. okay? And we, one of the things that we're working on, and this is gonna be a big community thing, we hope anyway, but uh, we're getting stuck into it now, is our 40K coverage is building up and it's gonna be centered around a campaign. Yeah. So we're designing, building, constructing all of the elements to do a campaign between now and Christmas or now and New Year, mm -hmm. okay? or now in the end of January. We haven't decided just how long it's going to stretch. Um, what it is, is we're writing a story. Um, uh, it's a very themed uh, exploration of 40K for us, okay? And it all starts with a very small skirmish 
that takes place out on an ocean world, mm -hmm. okay? That's as much as I'm gonna say just about that because it's, it's all coming forward and we're hoping that you guys will join in with us as we get this thing up and running. We'd like to know about your games, you can watch them. We're gonna have you to be able to submit stuff. Hell, if you even wanna help us get the, the armies and things together because it's, the engagements are gonna ramp up very quickly and by the end of this, it's like apocalypse mm -hmm. and maybe beyond. Um, so much so that I'm even considering in the new year, not only having an online event where people can uh, join in the campaign, so there could be total destruction taking place on a world. Mm -hmm. I'm also considering if we could get enough people interested in maybe hosting something in Nottingham, mm -hmm. where we actually have uh, the final the final game played out, and people can come so along the, the and final play with us. Cataclysmic event. Yeah, Could be cool. um, so I'm going to be talking to some venues in around the Middle England uh, yeah. type area to see if they're interested in, in working with us to do that. In the meantime, if that's something you're interested in, post below, because if it's the kind of thing that we're not going to get very many takers for, we'll just stick to what we do, which is online, and we'll get people working that way. But if you fancy coming along and actually spending that day or that weekend with us, playing out the final epic kind of scene of this campaign that we're working on and you can get involved hell maybe we do that mm -hmm. okay in which case it may not be january you might say well actually we're going to stretch it out a bit longer to mm -hmm. give people more time mm -hmm. but back to my issue obviously then we have projects running for that yeah one of the projects i had is this first engagement um i'm actually creating a force for it, okay um it's a, like i said it's a small engagement it's taking place out in an ocean world and it's what has happened is orcs have overrun this area, mm -hmm. okay? Small number of orcs. And I've created what I'm classifying as an Imperial Navy um, insertion team, okay? So I wanted something that was a bit more Rainbow Six. So yeah. a bit more Black Ops? Yes. Uh, so um, I decided I want to try and create something themed around the Imperial Navy because mm -hmm. you know that they have their their Valkyries and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're we're using whatever rules we find, and if we need to tweak a rule or somewhere here and there, we will tweak it. Now we're, we'll tweak rules, not as in um, rules that are that are going. We have built make this the random stat yeah. line. We're we're tweaking rules to allow us to do things such as mm -hmm. that uh, in the turn uh, that they arrive in turn one they disembark. Um, we do a roll off to see if the Valkyries stick around or if the Valkyries fuel level is too low, in which case they have to disengage straight yeah, away. So if, yeah. if, if the Valkyries around, stick around, they might get one turn of shooting or something yeah, to try and support sport. the ground yeah. uh, the, the, on the ground. However, if the Valkyries stick around, the orcs might have a quad daca gun that might be able to take him out, in which case the guy's really in the shit, okay? So we're, we're putting some interesting kind of like narrative rules into the game. But I have this project, and I've needed something to very quickly store the project in, yeah. store the paints and things that I'm using for the project in one little tidy little container, mm -hmm. which means that whenever I come back to the project, because I can't work on it all the time, and then, for example, I work down here in the studio sometimes, but then we film this, so I have mm -hmm. to pack it away. The D-Box mm -hmm. is the way to go. So I got this. And it came with a standard loadout. So I'm gonna show you guys some of it and you can start to, to see what's happening. So on the top layer, so it's cardboard, yep. okay, which is, which is dead handy. And in the top layer, okay, I have a, a Kraken, just a little trip tray, okay? So in that trip tray, you can start to see the, the Imperial kind of um, insertion forces are like uh, commandos. I've got a really cool picture of these guys. Uh, they're not finished yet, mm -hmm. but I've got a cool picture of them standing out as if they're spilling out of the back of a, a Valkyrie. Cool. Um, these guys I opted for, I didn't go with your normal guardsmen. They're being fielded as, oh, I'm still getting the hang of this guy, so bear with me. I think it's the Tempestus uh, Militarum Scions, mm -hmm. okay? Um, which was the best fit for what I was able to do for this yeah. particular um, part of the story. However, the models, the models came from Anvil. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. How cool are they? These feel really, really black ops. Aren't they awesome? Yeah. There's something quite Halo about these guys. We'll get you close-ups of these mm-hmm. anyway, but um, whenever I was digging around, um, I saw that Anvil were doing these. They're called the Grenadiers. They're from their Afterlife um, game that they're working on. Um, but they, they, were, they were very happy for me to, to use, uh, to try and pull together my campaign and stuff, because I wanted something um, a bit different. Yep. Mm-hmm. And they just worked great. Mm-hmm. So in the next layer, I get the larger trip tray. Now's the point where I say, okay, they're not going in on their own. Okay, I wanted to give them something heavier to back them up, Mm -hmm. okay? A little bit of support. So, you guys know that I'm no fan of Ogrins, Mm -hmm. okay? I've detested Ogrins for a long time. I know they're a big part of the story. I just always found them really cheesy, uh, a really cheesy part of the story. I wasn't into the, if you can genetically modify something, why would you genetically modify it to make it big and stupid? Why would you not do what you're already doing to the Space Marines, which is making them big and epic? Yeah. Uh, so I never really got my head around the Ogrens. It was like we raged about Harlequins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Last week. Yeah, last week I was raging about Harlequins and how Harlequins just were a really strange element of the story and kind of broke me out of it. Mm. Ogrens, I find the models... Um, I'm sure if you're into your Ogrins and stuff, you look at the models, you think, yeah, great, they're, they're really good representations of it. The fact that I dislike Ogrins in the first place made me look at them and I just go, ooh, it's another big cartoony aspect of 40K mm-hmm. that I wish wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted to use their stat lines because I wanted to get something heavier and well-armored right, so you, you in there. you can accept that they have a, a purposeful role on the battlefield. Yes. I just don't like the look of them. So... In my next tray, which is that, I have these guys. Those look familiar. They will look familiar because these are from dust. You've done a really nice job on those. Well, they're not finished by a long shot, and I'm no painter, by the way. Um, but you know, I'm. I want to be involved in this. This is. Uh, you know, we we're committed to this getting back into 40k and doing it doing it our way. You know, I'm loving the 7th edition rules. This is how I'm doing it. I don't like Ogrins. I wanted to swap them out. So these guys here are the Steel Guard Assault Squad. Okay? Mm-hmm. They're the U, uh, they're USR from the... I believe the box you is sitting over SSU. there. SSU. 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 So if you pass me over the, that box right, there, John. John is dropping off camera for a sec. Oi, Oi. There we go. So these guys here. I happen <coughs> to have... Uh, three of these that were kind of spare. Mm-hmm. Now, I was I was at that point where I was going, oh, I don't want to use them because I want them for dust. <laughs> and I talked to Lloyd about it, and Lloyd is going allies, okay? I've went uh, with, the, with the Reich, of course, because they're all going to be painted silver. <laughs> and I've got the Americans. And you've got the Americans. Hopefully. Uh, um, uh, we did have, even with we we even with when we pointed out our armies, we did have them spare. And Lloyd said to me, "Oh, go on then." So I did it, and uh, I I put them together, and I think they fit really really well. Yeah. So they're fielded as Bulgrins, and the reason for that is the Bulgrins have that big ass shield. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they act as uh, they act as armored cover. Uh, the rules suited to them. Uh, suited them. Mm-hmm. The fact that Bulgrins are low intelligence, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, they uh, suited these guys because they're in kind of suits. It's a clumsy. So thing. it's a clumsy thing. It's yeah. well armored, but it's clumsy. Really yeah. yeah. So I thought this actually suited with the narrative really, really well. Mm-hmm. So that is tray two. Now, other than that, what I'm going to do for these is two flyers. Okay, so they're going to be inserted. Mm-hmm. by two flyers. This is the point where I'm basically tweaking the rules again. Is it, And maybe you guys can help me out with this. Um, is it within the rules currently that I could have to uh, attach 10 of these guys to one Valkyrie and three of these guys to another Valkyrie? Um, I'd like to know if I can do that or am I having to veer from the rules too much to be able to do that? Because it takes place in an ocean environment, they ain't going to drive up there in armored yeah, transports. It makes sense that mm. multiple units would be dropped in via different things if they couldn't fit into the one. So um, there's an interesting one. You can let me know if, uh, if you feel I'm stretching things a bit too far or will that work fine. 
My next layer, I keep paint brushes. So I just, just like out there. So just all the different paint brushes and stuff that I use and the little uh, hobby knife uh, is in there. And then my final layer, again, I'm now realizing after Justin took me through the whole privateer press thing that this was all designed for privateer press minis, well, but the versatility of it. One of these, mm -hmm. it should fit directly in there without a hitch. And there you go. There it does. Perfect. So this box is designed for privateer press. However, here at Beast of War, it's been designed for keeping projects in. <laughs> Cause this last one, I was able to keep all my various uh, paints and bits and pieces that's that really I'm clever. using. It's you're, not great. You're really able to clever. keep track of a project rather than putting the paints away again and going, yeah, oh, what shade of blue was, was that? Yeah, well, which, which paint did I use for that? Well, why can't I find that? Yep. So I have everything that I need for this project in here. Mm -hmm. When the project's done, they'll be transferred to wherever they're gonna live permanently. Mm -hmm. And then this will be freed up for the next one, nice. which will be the orcs. Yeah, cool. And then it'll be a whole different set of paints. So as a versatile little product goes, mm -hmm. I really like it. The other thing I like about it is for some reason, it reminds me of Thunderhawks. <laughs> it does remind me of Thunderhawks. I just want to paint it silver. Do you remember Thunderhawks? Is this a TV show? Yes. I vaguely, vaguely remember let, it. Let me see if I can get your memory back. <laughs> No, you've lost me. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Thunderhawks. Terrahawks, even. Thunderhawks. What am I talking about? Terrahawks. No, no, you've completely lost me. Oh. Sorry. They had little cubes, little cubes and little spheres. And the spheres uh, sounded like your man from Ain't Half Hot Mom. Lovely Ain't boy. Ha Ain't Half Hot Mom? What? Oh. oh I'm doing this it's, it's totally lost on him. Yeah. So anyway, that is the Battle Foam D-Box. This is my Imperial Navy. Um, so far so good, mm -hmm. yeah, so far so good. good. I'm pleased with it, I'm enjoying it, and I think that's the main thing. So let me know whether you, uh, you like the Imperial Navy stuff, or you like the idea of what we're doing with the campaign, whether you'd like to get involved, either by playing where you are and submitting results, or by coming along to a possible event that we might hold where we actually play it out, or maybe you want to get even more deeply involved and help us paint up some of the armies or build some of the terrain and stuff like that that we are needing for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically between now and the end of the year or maybe into next quarter, mm -hmm. we're gonna play out something that I think is gonna be kind of awesome. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna take a, a quick break. After the break, I'm gonna talk about Battle Zones, Carnivale, and I've got a bit of a chat about Normandy versus Waterloo. We'll be right back. And we're back. Um, now's a good time to just pay a little tribute to uh, Rick Mayo, who died there, unfortunately, this week. Mm. Um, our fabulous, wonderful Lord Flashheart. Um, I think we have to do a quick tribute after three. One, two, three. Woof! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Battle Zone Summer Challenge. We yep. talked about it last week. It is launching as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Joel and R, one of the members on Beast of War, has put up this image. He said, I'm getting stuck in. How cool is that? All his stuff is sitting on the table, mm -hmm. all ready to go. Well played, that man. Um, we are starting to get feedback and stuff now from a lot of people who want to get involved and in we're that. We're starting to get our own stuff sitting prepped. Mm -hmm. Our own stuff is now prepped. He's been clipping away and yeah, getting stuff I, I've going. I've been sitting watching Daxter on Netflix and just clipping and filing. Um, if you want to know what it's all about, um, go and watch Last Weekender. Or I'll quickly recap for you. Um, while I'm recapping for you, we'll bring up some uh, example pictures to try and you know, inspire you into some of the things you can do. Yeah, well, there's, there's some from Mantic and some from community members. Okay, so what, what it is, is Mantic Games have the Battle Zone terrain, okay? This is a modular terrain system that is basically the Lego of wargaming. You buy this, you lose your week completely. <laughs> Pardon me. We, so This box is at least a month. Yes, apparently it's five hours just to clip what's in this box. That's not including filing. And that's not including filing. Filing? Filing and cleaning up mold lines? No, 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 not mold lines. That's for wimps. Filing. 
<laughs> quite simply because this is such a precise system. Yeah. You have to clean it, otherwise you're going to have to bother with it. If you haven't bothered with this system, give it a final clean because that's probably the bother you're having. There you that's, go. That's what you're going to hear um, later on in the show when we go, well, what hobby work did you do today? Well, Justin learned how to <laughs> file. Yeah, on XLBS, <laughs> what did you do this week? I filed and cleaned. <laughs> so, uh, basically the thing is, we're doing a summer challenge. Over the summer, here at Beast of War, we're going to be working with this stuff, and we've invited you as a community to get involved. So go and grab yourself some of this Battle Zones terrain, build yourself something op uh, awesome, okay? At the end of the summer, um, and during the summer, we're going to be posting you. Welcome to come on over to the, the forums that we have here and post your progress and things. At the end of the summer, we're going to be judging all the entries and stuff. Now, what are you going to get from it? Well, you're going to get a summer of great terrain building, okay? You're going to get, get comradeship from all of us here at Beasts of War. And what sympathy you're doing. from your friends. Now, <laughs> that's at the very least. And for many of us, that's probably enough. However, we're going to sweeten the data. There will be prizes. And for the winner, the grand prize is going to be whatever terrain you've built, if you win it, okay, if your terrain used less than what's in this box, mm -hmm. you will get this box. Not this one, because it's empty now, because we're clipping it. But the contents of this box, in a box like this, yes. You will get a brand new one of these boxes, which is full of it. Yes, like him. You're full of it. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, if, however, you've used more terrain than what would be in this box, we're going to ship out to you an exact amount of what you have used. So you get it all back again. Now, for some people, they sit and go, Woohoo! best prize in the world. Other people are thinking, oh my God, I have to build it all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe by the end of the summer, that won't be such a good prize, in which case we'll, we'll change it. But it's awesome. It's an, an epic amount of terrain you're going to get. So you're going to get, at the very least, this amount, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely fabulous. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you understand it. I hope you've enjoyed some of the images that have come up to try and give you some inspiration. We have a project in mind. I've actually been... Um, on computer, on the putter, in Photoshop. Oh, yeah, we bet. Are we? Designing out, because I'm I've got an eight by four table with a, mm. with this name on it. You see, <laughs> as part of our 40k campaign, one of the scenes is going to be quite interesting, and I'm going to use this stuff to mm. try and mm -hmm. to try and replicate it. So, cool. and I think it'll play really really well for a game of 40k. That stuff would be awesome for Infinity as well because there's loads yep. of windows and things like that for I, I have seen that terrain being used for a host of different sci-fi games. Just all across the web they've been popping up. Also, somebody had mentioned recently how they quite liked it from even from a steampunk perspective that some of the stuff um, yeah, I guess you like the little cross that. pars and mm. yeah, uh, things yeah. like that there had a kind of a, a steampunk-esque kind of feel to it. Not all of it, mind you, yeah. but there's bits of it. Um, so that might be an eBay job where you're going on and trying to find uh, particular Specific pieces components. and things. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I suppose if you were doing a dockyards. Yeah. Something yeah. like that, maybe. So I don't know. You know, you're not limited to building something sci-fi yeah. for this challenge. In fact, if you build something that nobody's ever seen before, you're probably in with a better chance of actually winning yeah. the winning the thing. Points. Yeah. Because it, it, we're, we're always drawn to things that we've, we've never actually seen. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in terrain, I'm also doing a little segment in tomorrow's XLBS, which is the extra long backstage version of this show, where I'm going to be talking about city city buildings for city boards. Mm -hmm. um, we were getting a number of comments of uh, what were our suggestions for it, and I have a, I have a couple I'm going to show you in, in XLBS. Okay, uh, next piece of news is a very short one, but I wanted to talk to you guys about it because I know we're excited about it. And Sam, Sam will be doing little somersaults. Yeah, yeah. Like a little long-haired kind of <laughs> troll yeah. type thing. Ba basically, light a match. You've got a fire wheel. Yes, he'd be, he'd be like a, yeah. he'd be like a, a, like a, a what do you call it? Catherine, Catherine wheel. wheel. <laughs> Carnivale is coming back. Is coming back. I can't wait. Oh, I'm so glad to see that. Carnivale is uh, one of our favorite games. It actually is one of my personal favorite games. Uh, Carnivale is set in uh, Venice. Um, at least it was set in Venice. We're about to, I have no idea what's going to happen when it comes back because you know anything, anything can happen. happen yeah. So, But what it is, is 
it's a very it has a Cthulhu kind of a, 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 a aspect to it as well. So you yeah, have these very deep much, ones. Uh, the world has gone mad. Ah! There's a big kind of rent in the sky, a big tear in the sky, mm -hmm. and everything's going mad. And the story is told from the point of view of Casanova. Mm. And you have all these various uh, factions, like the crazy doctors of the Ospedale, and they've got the... The, yes, the, the, the plague doctor masks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have uh, the street people with the, the grotty kind of um, peasants and things. You have these awesome Cthulhu-esque kind of swamp and river creatures. Mm. And it, it's just, it's so good. What I love about the game, though, is the cinematic nature of it. Mm. It's... Uh, it's very much along the lines of jumping and spinning off buildings and things like yeah, that. It's so built to allow you to feel as if you're playing Assassin's Creed on the tabletop. Yes, it's very much it. like that. It is very much like that. And it came out before Assassin's Creed 2, which is kind of cool. Um, but it's back. They ran into some trouble last year um, where they, the whatever shape or whatever way they they were working with the company, it wasn't panning out for them anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so they went back to the drawing board mm -hmm. to work out where they were going to go and what they were going to do next. Apparently it's all solved now, so they're coming back. I think they're going to go back to Kickstarter. They've learned a lot from the last two Kickstarters that they've run. Yeah. So they're coming back to, to do something interesting. So if Carnivale was your thing, we did a week, a themed week about yeah, Carnivale. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. A link here, um, myself and Sam explored it and we we loved it. It's, it's a really, really interesting game, well worth uh, taking a look at. However, I don't like as interesting story. as all of that is, we have a couple of anniversaries mm -hmm. this weekend, or the, over these Look, next couple of weeks and yeah. the last previous week. So you've just been to Normandy, mm -hmm. where they were, it was the anniversary of D-Day. Was it the 50th anniversary 70. or 75th? 70th. 70th. Now, John spent two weeks over there. Two weeks. <clears throat> and he documented it as well. You did like a little video diary of yeah. it all. So we're looking at the possibility of doing John's Days in Normandy. Or John Days, or oh. something. Some <laughs> in France. It's, um, but the other uh, anniversary that's coming up is on the 18th of this month mm -hmm. is the anniversary of Waterloo. Now, Napoleonics, don't yawn, either of you, okay? Napoleonics, stop it. Napoleonics is one of those things in wargaming that is enormous, mm -hmm. okay? Napoleonics, um, like we are, we are getting into historical. It started last year with uh, my journeys into Flames of War with Flames of War for the Win, which aired this week, by the way. Flames of War for the Win is back. And I started to get into the, the more historical aspects of that and with bolt action, etc. History is not my thing, okay? However, something strange is happening to me, okay? Because I'm, I'm starting to feel so little... The, the, the full moon's arising? There's, you there's grumblings. There's, like there's, there's little rumblings. There's, there's, something, there's something wrong with me because when I heard that the Waterloo anniversary was coming up, I thought to myself... I think I'm quite interested in finding out more about that because I knew nothing yeah. about Waterloo. I looked at Napoleonics, okay, and I thought they're the most ridiculous looking thing I've ever seen, okay? You're going to war like a peacock yeah. and you wonder why you die because they can see you. That's why you die. You're, you're dressed like a peacock. I then, Alessio Cavatori recommended that I watch a movie, and he actually sent the movie over to me. Yeah. Uh, it was called uh, Barry Lyndon. Mm -hmm. That just reinforced the whole Napoleonic thing, because those guys got into battle and marched directly at each other, firing muskets. Yep. And I thought, you bloody idiots. Why are you doing that? Why are you not on the ground firing muskets or skirmishing around the side or, or doing this? But it was my own ignorance that was getting the better of me. So, when I heard the anniversary of, of it was coming up, I thought, I'm gonna have, have a look into this. So I started to read. Yes, I know. And 
Andrea has a big book called The Waterloo, I think it's The Waterloo Companion. Mm -hmm. And it's a massive, massive big book. There's an interesting story about this in that um, a few years back we visited the Perrys. Mm -hmm. And we went into the Perrys uh, game room where they were showing us off the, their Waterloo stuff and all the Napoleonics. And they have enormous amounts of Napoleonics yeah, in this yeah. fabulous game room. Yeah, they have full uniforms and stuff sitting on mannequins and stuff. It's great. So um, while we were there, um, I started to get an interest in this. And I thought to myself... I really need to, to look into this Napoleonic stuff because so many people mm -hmm. are interested in it. And I couldn't really grasp why they were interested in it. So I was asking them at the time, you know, is there any good books that you know I could use to try and steer myself into this? Yeah. And they brought these books out and they set them down in front of me and they said, that one in the middle is the one you want. If you can get a hold of that. That would be that would be Mark the best one for you. Yeah. So I was writing the names of these books down on my phone, and uh, I came home, and I was steeping in the bath. I think we'd just arrived back, and I was up in the bath, and I was telling Andrea, bending her ear about Napoleonics and how much fun I'd had, and you know, it was really, really interesting. And uh, you should see the uniforms, and and you believe it, Andrea? One man actually represents ten men or twenty men. <laughs> You know, they work on a representation system there, Andrea, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Poor Andrea was like completely bored. And I said, I'm looking for some books. So after I get out of the bath here, I might go on to Amazon and see if I can find these books. And she says, well, what's the names of the books? And I, I, I said, well, the only book I'm really after is this one. Because he said, I can't go wrong if I have this book. So I read the name of it, The Waterloo Companion. And I was lying there. She'd went all quiet. And I thought... Oh, I've bored her to death. That's it. She's she's away. She's not going to talk to me. Next thing, she knocks the door. And I said, what? And this arm appears around the door with the book. Is it this one? <laughs> Is it this one? And I went, oh, where did you get that? She says, it's been sitting on our bookshelf for the last year and a half. It was part of her collection as she studied history. So uh, I had it. Hmm. I meant to read it. I looked through it a couple of times. But there was, there was a lot of detail in it. And we got carried away with other stuff. But then the, this anniversary came up and I thought, I'm going to look into it. So I've been reading up on it and holy moly, holy moly, I've enjoyed D-Day. Yeah. Right? Oh, when I say enjoyed D-Day, I use that term loosely. It's, um, uh, myself and Dave even tried our own kind of uh, attempt at battling out D-Day mm -hmm. um, because it was a very specific set of circumstances D-Day. You've enjoyed your exploration into D-Day. Mm -hmm. And it gave us an opportunity to to see what, on the tabletop at least, uh, what a beach landing might look like. And we learned a lot from that demo game, like um, how the attacker needs to have substantially more force yep. than the defender in order to actually realistically replicate that. Mm -hmm. And as, um, as world-changing as D-Day was, and there's no doubt about it, yeah. it, it was a world-changing event, I cannot believe how I've only now realized how world-changing Waterloo actually was, okay? <laughs> Waterloo to me was, oh, it was another one of them Napoleonic those, those battles. battles that yeah. happened way back then. They, yeah, they, they didn't really make much difference to the world. Yeah, they, they fought over women's handkerchiefs and stuff <laughs> like that there. Um, but, oh, no, 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 no. That battle shaped Europe for a hundred years. It's probably, we're probably still feeling the effects of that battle today. Right. So we are. That's how... Uh, uh, world changing it was let me put this into perspective what I've learned about Napoleon is um, I, I got this quote I'm not sure how accurate this quote is because I tried to research it a bit and uh, its accuracy is a bit mm, but Napoleon apparently was involved in more battles than Caesar Hannibal um, maybe Genghis Khan and another geezer who did a, a lot of fighting, all put together. Right. Um, anywhere between 60 and 100 battles, Napoleon was there. When you look at his control over Europe, he completely controlled Europe. At the age of 30, Justin. Mm. At the age of 20-something, he managed to get himself made emperor. Yeah. And then by 30, he controlled Europe, and he defeated the Russians 
the only thing that stopped him plowing all through Russia was... Uh, I'll assume the terrain. The weather. Yep. Same thing had happened to the Germans. Yep. Now, how the Germans didn't learn from that, I don't know. Uh, you know how they went in uh, when, on their battles on the Eastern Front and didn't learn from what Napoleon faced. There was a, a historian on a, a documentary that said, it's almost as if the Germans were surprised to find that Russia would get cold in winter. Because the last army to do it was Napoleon's army. And, and they faced exactly the same they thing. They faced the same conditions. They, they defeated the, the army. Because the Germans, to be fair, whenever they first uh, assaulted the, the East, I think they effectively defeated the Russians as well. To a point. To a point. Yep. But then couldn't go any further because of the weather. Mm. Napoleon hit the, hit the very same thing. So, he conquered pretty much all of Europe. Yep. Uh, didn't conquer the British Isles. Mm -hmm. Okay, but... Uh, Prussia and all of this. He, he was fighting engagements in Egypt, in uh, Crete, I think, and, and all around. Like, I mean, uh, his I, I'll empire. assume he wasn't personally at each of these battles. He was yes. directing them from home. No, he was there. The only okay. way back then to direct a battle was to be there. Yeah. Fair enough. This guy stood or, well, on his horse in the back line or, or at his little table mm -hmm. and strategically worked out each of these battles. That's fair enough. Apparently, from a strategic perspective, Napoleon was unmatched mm -hmm. strategically. Um, however, tactically, he, made, um, he had faults, but I think anybody tactically, you cannot, you know, tactics is a very difficult thing. Str strategic, strategy is one thing. Tactics ebb and flow, so you can make tactical errors, but you, you, strategically he was unmatched. You can lose a battle, but you can still win a war. So what happened was he controlled Europe, yep. okay? However, there was unrest at home in Paris, and they, uh, they, they basically handed him over to the English, okay? And then the English sent him off to an island mm -hmm. uh, to live in isolation, okay? In isolation, he was able to take something like 600 of his own soldiers with him. Um, that basically became his bodyguard yep. yeah, on this household. island. During the seven years that passed, he lived on this island, apparently pouncing back and forward like a caged tiger. This is a guy who was 90% uh, ambition, 10% magnificent britches. Okay? So, during that seven years, though, unrest started to develop because they reinstated the monarchy. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... The, the people in France, certainly in Paris, mm -hmm. um, if you're sitting there and you know more about this than I do, please forgive me because I know I'm kind of teaching my granny to suck eggs, but this is what I've learned. But the people in Paris were starting to get unrest and, what, and were not liking the conditions. Napoleon was a gambler, not a gambler in money, mm -hmm. but he took risks that were unbelievably risky. Okay. Yeah, so he'd risk a thousand men to do whatever. Oh, uh, easy. Uh, a thousand men. Would I tell you about armies, Waterloo? Armies didn't matter. <laughs> so he did one last cast of the die and came off the, the island where he was exiled mm -hmm. and uh, landed back in France, okay, and started to make his way to Paris, okay? And he was met on the road by, um, I don't know if it was a general or something with a contingent of men that were sent to arrest him, okay? Mm -hmm. And the officers were telling the soldiers, ready, aim, to fire, fire upon yeah. him. Napoleon went up, bared his chest, and said, which one of you is going to kill your emperor? <laughs> and all the soldiers laid down his arms, and they all or laid down yeah. their arms, and they converted to Napoleon's side. Mm. So Napoleon, uh, over the course of those weeks, went back to Paris... Mm -hmm. Retook the emperorship, uh, the 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 whole the monarchy that was in place fled again, mm -hmm. and he got the army and all behind him. Mm -hmm. But he tried to make peace. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the reason he was trying to make peace was because he wasn't fully he wanted mobilized. To his position. Yeah, so he wasn't fully mobilized. So he tried to make peace. However, by this stage, the English, the Prussians, and I think the Russians. Um, I assume they're all looking at it going, oh, for God's sake, we already got rid of you. Yes, that was it. We will, uh, we will oh, and under no Not circumstance again. is any country to make peace with Napoleon. Mm. And they then declared war. And they didn't declare war on France. They declared war on one man. So they declared war on Napoleon mm. himself. Now, 
a, small, a series of engagements happened, all right? And it all mm -hmm. accumulated with being in Waterloo, okay? If Napoleon won this, his yeah, empire but... would have been bang, back and intact, mm -hmm. okay? So this was, this was absolutely crucial. This was the make or break of whether Europe was going to be run by a single emperor or not. So Waterloo, he came up against another general, which you all have heard of, called Wellington. Mm -hmm. Waterloo, again, this is all going to sound so basic, is in Belgium. I thought Waterloo was somewhere in France, but it's not. <laughs> it's in Belgium. So Waterloo they, uh, was where... Wellington wanted this engagement to take place, okay? He felt the conditions at Waterloo would have suited him better. And Wellington was very, very astute as well, strategically. Um, whereas Napoleon had great respect for his soldiers, and the soldiers had incredible respect for him, mm -hmm. Wellington was much more upper class. Smelly little blighters we have in our army today. We'll get rid of them first, shall we? What, what? <laughs> so... But he was very strategically astute. So you had these two massive armies facing off. Mm -hmm. However, there were two building complexes on the battlefield. And it was those building complexes that stopped the French from being able to completely overrun the British. Because if they hadn't have been there, they were outnumbered enough that, and the French were so well trained that I they would have they just, just... roll up the flank. They would have just rolled over. Mm -hmm. They could have rolled over just uh, from just straight away mm. um, from a full frontal attack. Here's where some interesting things of the battle, and this is where it all starts to get wargaming related, okay? Mm. Um, so, Wellington has the English, okay, behind a hill, or mm. kind of standing on top of a hill with some of them behind the hill, mm. which meant that all the French artillery and the cannons and stuff like that, were killing guys. Like they did get badly, badly uh, uh, done in with these cannons. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the guys were behind the hill, so they didn't get the full effects of it. Right. Because a cannon is a devastating thing, all right? Because a cannon uh, will actually bounce three yeah. or four times. Yeah, it'll start just chewing through guys. Yeah, and it'll take your head off even after the fourth or fifth bounce, yeah. you know, a, a cannonball. And like these were like 12 pounders that the, that the French were unleashing. So as all this was firing, they, they kind of moved their men slightly back, mm. okay? However, Napoleon, it seems, was sick at the time or wasn't well, okay? Mm. The battle didn't start early in the day because Napoleon felt that the ground was too wet, mm. um, that he wouldn't be able to get his guns in place, his cavalry would get stuck. So yeah. he, he delayed. Now, some people say it was to do with the weather. Other people say that he had really bad stomach issues at the time right. and that he just he wasn't feeling himself. Mm. He had a general, okay, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he had a general who was um, basically doing the, taking control of it while Napoleon was doing whatever he was doing on the mm -hmm. dunny. And this general apparently was fearless, but not particularly strategic. Mm -hmm. You know what that means. That means you're sending <laughs> in and not thinking through the consequences of it. Yeah, he, he's saying the cannons are killing guys. I'm not seeing more coming over the hill. That must be all there is. Mm. Go for it. So what he did was exactly that. Yep. Apparently the common tactic at the time was whenever you saw your opponents disengage and start to retreat, mm. you unleash your cavalry, okay? Mm -hmm. And he unleashed 12,000 horses of cavalry, okay? okay. And basically the, the English weren't retreating, okay? They were repositioning. So what the English did was that they ran, uh, they moved into the center of the field, mm -hmm. okay? and form defensive squares. Yep, form square. Now this I had never seen before. And this is why um, I'm looking forward to try and getting into some Napoleonic because battles. you've now seen how that works. Yeah, I've it's... never seen it on a gaming table before. I want to see, and do you know what? I might contact Warlord about this. I might yeah. see if I can get Warlord and ask them about this. Uh, do the defensive squares and things like that actually take place on the tabletop, do, do, is that taken into account? Because what happened was they created these squares, Justin, of men, okay, mm -hmm. with their bayonets out. So basically spiky squares. Yeah. And that tactic 
was purely uh, to play on animal instincts. You know, a horse won't horse. charge into a solid mass. Well, well, no, it's it, won't a spiky mass. it won't charge against something sharp. Yeah. Mm. It knows better. <laughs> so what they did was you had these 12,000 uh, horses Aye, and they, charging they can't in. Get in. And they're killing lots of people, like the death toll. Do you want to know how many people died in this battle? Go ahead. Somewhere between 40,000 and 60,000 men died in that battlefield. Mm -hmm. That is extraordinary. A few years back, they found an intact skeleton of one of the, one of the Englishmen, mm -hmm. uh, apparently still on the battlefield. So anyway, they, they went in. And they weren't able to do a lot of damage, but they took a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And what they did was they went in, retreated, and went back. And they went back three or four times they redid this charge uh, to try and see if they could break I, the line. I'll assume this general at the back is going, are they dead? No, sir. Get back there! Yeah, but I would imagine that was pretty yeah. much it. Back in again, back in again, back in again, mm -hmm. because it was purely a numbers game, which is something I'm going to talk to you about in a second. Get these guys in there to destroy them. It got to the stage where Wellington knew that if one more, if they sent one more cavalry charge in, that it was going to break and they were going to lose. Yeah. And he's very calmly sitting on his horse going, if they send one more in, we're done for. We really need reinforcements. And by that stage, they, what they were waiting for was the Prussians. Mm. The Prussians had this old, crazy 70-year-old guy um, who was in charge of them, white beard, loved mm -hmm. battling, hated Napoleon, mm. absolutely hated Napoleon. This was entirely personal with these guys. Mm. And they were quite happy to see thousands of men die because they wanted to stick that right, bugger's that. nose in it. Mm. And when you hear the end of the story, because this is a bit that confounds me more than anything, the, the Prussians finally did arrive. arrive yep. okay? But before that, one of the key things, as I was saying, was these two buildings. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of them was like a farm type thing. I think they're both kind of farmyards. But one of them in particular, Napoleon realized, or at least made the, made the decision, had to be taken at all costs. Right. Whatever you do, you have to take it. I think it was called Le, Le Hayes Saint or Le Saint Hayes or something. Mm -hmm. And they tried to take it. And there was a very small contingent of um, English. And I think some... Prussians, uh, a few hundred Prussians, there were 400 men in it, English and Prussians, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they managed to hold off an assault on it. Mm -hmm. But they came back and assaulted them again. By this stage, they'd run out of ammo, and they did. And of the 400 men that were in it, only 40 of them got out alive. Mm -hmm. And at that point, then, it all, it all changed. So, the cavalry was done. Mm -hmm. uh, during those, there wasn't another assault of the cavalry because by that stage, the cavalry had been effectively defeated. Yeah. So Napoleon walked up and thought, we're in trouble now. But did he retreat? No, not a bit of it. He looked over and he saw the troops coming to reinforce, knew that it was the Prussians, mm -hmm. told his own men it was the French uh, that were coming to reinforce them because he didn't want to drop in morale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, uh, the, the general that had sent the cavalry in says, the cavalry have, have done their job, they have weakened their lines. And Napoleon said, and what was the point of that? You have destroyed my cavalry. Mm. I have no cavalry left. However, I have, still have my Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard were the veterans, yeah, okay? Yeah. These guys had fought battles over 20 years and had never lost a battle, apparently. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, would, um, they basically were, would do anything that they were asked by Napoleon. They would, do, they would unwaveringly mm -hmm. take orders. So what they did is they had muskets, okay? And this is the bit that I didn't understand in Barry Lyndon of why the hell would they march straight at each other firing the muskets? Mm -hmm. And the reason for it is, is at, I think it was either 100 yards or 50 yards. Okay. This is the whole accuracy yeah, thing? Yeah, at 100 yards, one in 30, 30 or 37 Something like that. shots would hit on target. So uh, basically nothing. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a Smith-Bore rifle. At 50 yards, one in three 
would, sh uh, would hit. And that's why they marched towards each other firing. Although we look at it today like a completely insane tactic, mm -hmm. based on the equipment that they had available to them, um, it was an that was the tactic they had I think, to use. I think it was the only tactic they, yeah. they, they really had. Because I was trying to think after, uh, after reading about this, surely there's got to be another way. Because, but then if you don't have the accuracy in your weapons, mm -hmm. then you're basically all you can do, yeah, all you can do is go into close combat. Mm -hmm. And in close combat, you have the bayonets and things like mm -hmm. that there. So that marching towards had to happen. Mm -hmm. Because previously in the likes of the, the times of Troy and stuff like that, they would have marched towards each other, they would have ran towards each other, a full charge, and went in with their close combat. Mm. This was not much different. The real killing took place in close combat, mm. but you had that added thing of, we have ranged firepower. Yes, we can weaken you while we get there. But it's not accurate. Yeah. It's not accurate enough to do damage from any distance. Therefore, all we can do is understand that our lines are going to be weakened. Uh, on the way in. So what you have is two distinct tactical, uh, is this tactics or is this strategy? Well, I'll call them tactical differences, mm -hmm. okay? The French fought in columns, mm -hmm. okay? So they would have had a column, maybe 18 men, 18 lines deep, okay? Mm -hmm. So that column would have been a bit like this, mm -hmm. okay? And then the front of the column only the first two could shoot, mm -hmm. okay? The rest of the column, all they were doing was marching over the, the top of the corpses of the guys waiting in front, their turn. waiting for their turn. The English had a very different uh, tactic to this. This was the- Lines. This was the three rank fire mm -hmm. as well. They had a three rank, rank line that stretched and stretched and stretched. And the thing about that was that everybody could shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, well, they you're, could you're bringing shoot. more firepower to bear. Yes, it's mm. inaccurate, but you fling enough so something's got to stick. The way the British did it, whereas the French were firing front row nailing, second rank stood, the British were firing front row prone, second row nailing, mm -hmm. third row standing. Mm. So there was three ranks of muskets firing all the time. Mm. The only thing is, you can only stretch your line so far before the guys at the end become uh, Problem. ineffective. Yeah. Mm. So th there's only so far you can stretch a line. However, the other interesting thing about a line, as I see it, is when the battle does go into close combat, you can envelope, mm -hmm. you can envelop, yeah, you sorry. you can start getting yeah. the guys on the side. You can start to envelop and they can come in on the flanks, mm -hmm. which I think is an interesting thing. And I'm, I'm surprised that Napoleon had so, this, this to me seems to have been his fault, that by this stage, either he was too ill or too overconfident mm -hmm. that he didn't know his enemy. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, they didn't realize that the English um, had an attitude of, you will stand your line until you're dead or relieved. Mm -hmm. yep. You will not leave, mm -hmm. okay? Um, I think had he known that, and had he better understood the tactics of the English, it would have been a very different uh, outcome. Yeah, but his general seems to have just been a complete idiot. Who no, I don't believe that. he's an idiot at all. I believe he was enacting the the tactics of the time. You know, it's remember th this general had come up through many many battles, Justin. So like he didn't just crawl out of a bush and go, I'll do it. You know, it it, it tactically he made an error. But it was the tactics of the yeah. time. He wasn't. He wasn't doing anything out of the ordinary. And you you see this, this hubris. Well, we'll call it hubris then, mm. because Napoleon believed the tactics that had worked for him the past ten, fifteen, twenty years mm. were going to continue working. But when Napoleon came back and reformed the army, the British had changed. The Prussians yeah. were becoming one of the most effective militaries on the planet. For a long time, the Prussian military could quite happily say they had never lost a war mm -hmm. for a long time up until the, the Franco-Prussian War towards the 1780s, 1790s, something like that. There's the dates coming out. Yeah. <laughs> there's but, the dates there's coming that out. that degree pan off But bringing, mm -hmm. bringing it further forward into modern history in the Second World War, you see the same thing happening again. You see Rommel in Africa against Montgomery, mm -hmm. and Rommel keeps thinking, I'll attack this way. I'll, I'll go inland and attack Monty mm -hmm. inland. And Monty goes, that's fine, we'll make you think you can attack inland and we'll come along the coast. Mm -hmm. Because he could read Rommel doing the same thing over and over again and knowing he was getting success from it and Monty 
throwing them a dummy and going, we're going this way. There's a very human nature aspect to this in that when we're under pressure, we revert to what we know. Yeah. We revert to things that have worked for us in the past. Mm -hmm. When the reality is that we're probably in that situation because what we've done in the past doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's time to do something different. Mm -hmm. Do you know that whole thing of Einstein saying it's repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result mm -hmm. is the definition of insanity. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also the definition of a human being under pressure. Because when uh, human pe beings are under stress or under pressure, in this case it could have been illness or it could have been just watching the thing unravel in front of him, mm -hmm. you revert to what you know. Uh, but you take solace in what you know. Mm -hmm. I, so, I feel safe. two epic battles, Normandy, Waterloo, mm -hmm. both, both the, uh, were basically the defining battles um, of the of their era uh, of the nineteenth and twentieth century. Yeah. Um, Waterloo ultimately was won by Wellington. Okay, um, I'm not even sure that the Prussians got an awful lot of action in it at the finish up. Whenever the Imperial Guard marched up, mm -hmm. they didn't realize that there was f uh, either fourteen hundred or fourteen thousand Englishmen standing behind the hill that then came over the top. <laughs> and yeah, smacked and right in. Mm. Uh, they retreated for their first time ever, and uh, Napoleon uh, then retreated himself, and then to ensure that he got away, um, he had his army fire artillery into the midst of his own men. Nice guy, that. Yep. Nice guy, that. Yeah, this is um, what <clears throat> the, the beauty of it is, and I said this, uh, the, the bit that confounds me the most, is when it was over and Napoleon um, evacuated, um, he then contacted the English uh, to say, uh, okay, I give up. I would like to come to England now and live as one of the gentry. <laughs> and they said, no, no, unfortunately we're having none of that. Mm. And did they execute him? Um, or did his own people execute him for the amount of death and destruction that ultimately he not, had been involved in? No. They sent him off to an island to live in exile again. And he died after a few years of uh, arsenic poisoning from hair products. Uh, <laughs> how, how our great dictators go the, in the, yeah. days of, uh, the days of old. But it was just, it, it also hammers home to me how little was thought of the average soldier mm -hmm. um, that uh, the, 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 his officers were executed. Mm -hmm. But Napoleon, no, Napoleon, you can't execute an emperor. Yes, he, he, he was... A gentleman, you can't really kill the up and up. You, you can't kill an emperor. You, you might give the lower classes ideas mm. that they might be able to kill us too. So there, there we have it. Two extraordinary battles. Two very, very different battles. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And I think two amazing battles to try and play out on the tabletop. Mm. I have loved my exploration of World War II. I, I, I've got to say, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a convert. Uh, World War II, I will now openly admit to being an engineering nut. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's not much engineering in Waterloo, I've got to say. But I've got to, I've got to say, from, from my exploration of it now, mm. I can totally see the, 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 what, what, what the catches people in it. Yeah. Because it's like, it's like D-Day. And the what if scenarios, mm -hmm. you know, it, and I think that for uh, for historical gamers has got to be it. Yes, I laugh and joke about the button counters and the stitch counters and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to be fair, I'm not into that. Never will be into that. But the appeal of seeing ancient battles, mm -hmm. knowing the tactics and the limitations that were mm -hmm. there at the time, mm -hmm. and going. If they had done that differently, how would it have swung it? If yeah. that was different. But you could play this stuff using 40k. Yeah. You could basically go through the rules, mm -hmm. um, drop the ballistic skills, mm -hmm. um, increase the weapon skills, uh, have cavalry. Yeah, um, decrease the number of shots mm -hmm. where necessary. You don't need to go and buy Napoleonics to try this stuff. You just go in and tweak your stat lines, mm -hmm. tweak your, your rules a little bit, and you have Waterloo in the, in the 40th millennium. And you can try this out. Because I am fascinated by how could you have done it differently? Mm -hmm. Because you, you, the limitations don't change. Mm -hmm. 
those limitations are there. The armies don't change. Those armies are there. The only thing it could change is the order that you do stuff, a little bit of luck, because luck in battle is the same as luck on the tabletop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you really take, say, that, that manor house earlier in the battle. If Napoleon, if the ground had been dry, Earlier. Napoleon yep. uh, would have launched uh, one of his full uh, full frontal assaults. Mm -hmm. um, it, if the Brits hadn't, or the, the English hadn't the presence of mind to take those two buildings, mm -hmm. if they'd been stupid enough to just stand in a line and not take those buildings, mm -hmm. they'd have been dead. Let, let Napoleon's mm -hmm. artillery do the job for they, him. It would just went straight through. Mm -hmm. There'd have been nothing. There'd have been no kind of defensive barriers in the way. Yeah. If Napoleon had had... Enough to make another cavalry assault. Enough to make, make another cavalry assault. What would have happened? Mm -hmm. Or if the British didn't have the tactic of forming square. If the Prussians hadn't turned up. Yeah, and it had been the French, because there was a French reinforcement out there somewhere, but they haven't made it to the battle. The only reason the Prussians made it but they, did, they had no idea where this battle was taking place. And then they heard Napoleon's guns. Mm -hmm. And it was Napoleon's guns that brought them into the battle. Mm. It, it's it, it's extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary. But when you think of the quantity of men, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, we talk about apocalypse in 40K, right? Yeah. And apocalypse, we have a, oh, a 5,000 point army. A 5,000 point army. Would we have 100 infantry miniatures on the table? It, it probably wouldn't be a modern or a a Napoleonic regiment at the time. You know, 40,000 men dead. The army sizes were, I think the, the English had something like 120,000 men mm -hmm. and Napoleon had 140 or 160,000 men. Mm -hmm. 140,000 men. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just unreal. The numbers are mind boggling. You can totally see now why in the Napoleonic battles, they're talking about, yeah, that horse actually represents a hundred horses. Yeah. You know, it's... Um, yeah, to actually give you a true sense of the scale mm. of the battle. I watched Rick P Priestley play uh, a Napoleonic battle yeah. um, in the War Games Illustrated studio I was over at one point, and uh, I watched him. And him and Dan Falconbridge were playing out a Napoleonic engagement. And I did take the piss. Uh, because I kept saying to him, "There's not a lot dying here, gentlemen," is <laughs> and it, it was it, it was it was hilarious because you know they were bouncing off each other and bouncing off each other. But the thing was, there was a lot dying. Yeah. But there wasn't enough dying to represent the model taken to take, and, removed. To, yeah. to take right, off. Because that one horse represents say twenty guys. Mm -hmm. You see one mini coming off the table. They see twenty guys being off the yeah. table. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's extraordinary stuff. It, it's extraordinary stuff. Look, guys. Um, uh, there you have it. it you know, we're going to talk about uh, much, much more about um, uh, Normandy uh, in the XLBS. Uh, other things we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be talking um, about uh, city buildings and Gamer Dad returns. I haven't done Gamer Dad in, in a while. I've got something uh, cool that I want to talk about there. Um, look, thank you so much for watching. Thank you guys once again yep. for joining me. John, it's nice to talk history. And enjoy it. And enjoy it. <laughs> For a change. Um, if Napoleonics is your thing, um, let me know in the comments, because it's something that I'm quite interested in seeing Beasts of War take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're in the process of doing our World War II. Um, there's tons of history to choose from. Um, I just happen to think that this year, and especially next year, mm -hmm. um, it, might be a, it might be a nice time for us to have a look at Napoleonics and have a look at from the perspective of um, what makes it cool. Yeah. What, what would make it something that, uh, that we would want to play? We're coming from sci-fi, fantasy, steampunk backgrounds, mm -hmm. but we love our historical. We, we know this from the, the number of people that are involved in Flames of War for the Wind, involved with us in Bolt Action. Yeah. I want to see, uh, you know, Napoleonics, you know, the, 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 it, it's in, there's so much more there than the peacocks on the surface of it. The, yeah. the, so if you scratch a little bit, it is very interesting. So let us know. Final thing, we're going to show the Wilsung Venner 
I'm sorry, the Bullsong winner. <laughs> uh, you're on screen. You've won it, mate. You've got the you've got the the buildings. You've got the two starter sets. You've got the rule books and the the walkways. Uh, that'll be winging its way over to you from the guys at MicroArt Studios. As always, guys, look, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit with you for what's probably a very very long time this Saturday morning. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. Um, why not join us tomorrow morning for our show on XLBS, uh, where it's the extra long backstage. We'd be more than happy for you to come. If you're over with us doing the seven day free trial to get the dust uh, rules and things like that, why not stick around and join us for XLBS as well? And there's a ton, a metric ton of other content in there for you to enjoy. So until next time, happy gaming.